Hello, Spark fans. Welcome back to Advancing Spark, where since it's Halloween, I thought I'd give you guys a little treat. So I am off on holiday. There's going to be no videos for the next two weeks. But, you know, it's the last day of October, so I thought I might as well do a quick Databricks news roundup thing before I disappear off into the distance. So, as usual, we're going to grab the platform release notes. We're going to have a skim through. We're going to have a look at the latest runtime. I'm just going to see what's come in, what's changed, what behavior to expect differently, and what new features you have to play with. That's the plan. As always, don't forget to like and subscribe if you're new around here, and let me know down in the comments which bits you like, which bits you don't like. Anything that you've been waiting for, let us know down in the comments. All right, let's go and see what we've got. So, as usual, I'm on the Azure flavor of the release notes. There are AWS and GCP versions, but use the ones that make sense to you. And I'm going to go in October and scroll right down to the bottom. And then we'll go from the bottom up so we can get a nice chronological order. All right. First things first, there is a new runtime. So we have runtime 11.3. Very importantly, this is a new LTS version, long-term support. That means if you're after a version that's not going to change every six months, you want it fixed for 18 months or more, then you want to go and get onto that LTS version. So the previous one was 10.4. This 11.3 is your new LTS so if you're not in this constant migrating, upgrading cycle, then you want to be having a look at this anyway, because it's now GA, as we'll find out later. And yeah, it's the most current runtime for use. But we'll talk about what's in there in a moment. All right, so other changes. Uh, Unity Catalog now uh, has this privilege inheritance, which sounds terrible. Um, essentially, if you, have, if you grant access to, if, uh, if you say you can have everything in this schema and then you add new objects into that schema, it didn't always actually uh, flow down. They wouldn't get access to the new elements added after they've been granted things at the schema or catalog level. That now works properly. So there's a new privilege model. Uh, if you created uh, things, if you created your Metastore before uh, August, like August 25th, then you need to upgrade it. Otherwise, it won't work. It won't have that um, privilege inheritance baked in. So you'd assume it just worked that way. It didn't previously. It now does, which is good. Um, secret personas in the search experience. So one thing they've mentioned a few times in here is, again, remember that thing called the persona. The persona is that thing where we're in Databricks and we've got that little drop down saying, am I in the data science, data engineering workflow? Am I in machine learning? Am I in SQL? That little drop down is changing your Databricks persona. So what this is saying is the new search thing that we saw last time, which is where we can just search across objects in Unity Catalog, in kind of just notebooks, all of that kind of stuff. Um, if we're do changing our persona here, um, what we're saying is now this search is going to work across the different personas. So if we're in SQL, you still get the search. You can go and say, well, what have I got that mentions customers or whatever. Don't actually have uh, anything in my little search thing. It might find some work workbooks. It might find a table. Essentially, you've now got that search experience across all those personas, and that's all that's saying. So the SQL persona now has the same search that everything else does, which is all good. We also saw last time that um, SQL objects, so our, our queries, our dashboards, all those things, are now in the workspace. So you actually see them as file, files and folders and objects, meaning they get picked up by that search as well. So just a generally better integrated experience. Okay, admin protections, uh, you, can, you can stop uh, no isolation shared clusters getting their own... Uh, IDs, which makes sense. So we don't want to go off and, and do things like that. We don't want to enable people to circumvent any of our admin protection. So that's gotten slightly better. Uh, new, uh, there's a couple of different Partner Connect things. So Partner Connect is the third party ecosystem uh, that Databricks use. So they can say, well, actually, I want to use this other third party vendor and just automatically install it or plug into it or connect to it. So Hevo Data is, I believe, an ETL tool. So it's a cloud-based ETL, so you can do some orchestration, you can move data around, that kind of thing. That's now available in Partner Connect. Um, the Upload Data UI. So this has historically been terrible, and it's, it's, it's a little bit better now. <laughs> in that you can say, I would like to upload some data. Maybe I've got a CSV with a load of data, and I, just want, I don't want to have to do an engineering and plug it in and register it and write a load of code. I just want to go add data into Databricks, hit a button, and just have it automatically registered. That's what that does. And now you can do it again in all personas. So if you're in the SQL mode, machine learning mode, or your normal kind of data engineering, data science mode, you can hit that upload data button. Um, and more importantly, with uh, Unity Catalog, that'll create it properly in a data lake and do it as a managed table. Whereas if you use that and you're not using Unity Catalog, it's going to do it. It's going to upload it as a um, into DBFS, which is bad. We don't like. Don't don't do that. Yeah. Um, other bits. So yeah, I mean. Generally, the that add data portal has gotten better. 
there's now different ways we can actually go about adding data in and kind of working with that stuff. It's gotten kind of a little bit better for doing it. Again, I think that's coming through this uh, upload data areas as a whole. Now, way of kind of going and managing that. Again, I'm in DBFS mode there because that's not my Unity catalog enabled workspace. Okay, we've got a new thing. So you might have seen this uh, appear um, in some places. You've now got this idea of personal compute. So if you've got a bank of people and you don't want them kind of spinning up a whole massive full cluster to work on, uh, it's just like, no, just you can have a single node cluster. If you're just going to quickly check something, just spin up a single node cluster and that's all you need. And that's kind of what we got. So this idea of this personal compute policy where someone wants to hop on and check something, um, there's now a special policy that just allows people to essentially build out a single use, um, a single node uh, dangerous cluster. So this, this new type of cluster, they still act as interactive clusters or all-purpose clusters. They're still charged as all-purpose clusters, um, but they're deliberately single node clusters. You single access uh, user mode, so whoever creates it, you're, you're authenticating as them, and it's automatically picking uh, how that's working. So a little bit just trying to make it easier for people just to spin up a cluster and get working. But again, that's single node, so it's not going to be scaling out off a big data crunching. It's not for lots of work. It's just for quick checking and playing with stuff. Okay, uh, you can now use um, an Azure AD service principle to log into the uh, the Databricks API. So you can kind of go and do things like, you know, kind of, uh, as you're saying, create a Unity Catalog Metastore. You do identity management and add users and groups and things. So you can now do that using the service principles. It's a little bit more baked into how people do DevOps. It makes a lot of sense. Now, this new one, this has been a long time coming. Um, so formatting Python code. Uh, and that's historically been something that can easily break um in that you know th th there were various different standards for how you want to lay out your python code and weirdly formatting in python code is always a touchy subject um because things like indentations have implicit meaning inside of python if you've got a if statement anything that is indented following that statement is considered part of that clause so you can't just throw it into a generic formatter and that will just tidy your code up because it might be adding things that are wrong therefore you need special python formatters and it's a whole thing so that's good. That's now you've been able to do that with um, SQL for quite some time inside of Databricks uh, notebook. You can just right click and go well, format this code. Um, and now we've got the same thing for doing uh, Python. So you can say, I just want to go and format this Python cell and it'll go and kind of format the cell and make it tidy. Now, I know saying, well, oh, uh, whose version of tidy? Whose version of formatted? What's it actually going to use? Uh, there's actually a good standard that uh, people tend to use in Python called Pepe. Uh, and the good news is they're using black, which is a very, very common uh, auto code formatter, uh, and that uses the PEP8 standard. Uh, so we internally in A, we use kind of a combination of um, black and uh, Flake 8. Flake 8 does a lot of other kind of syntactical highlighting and things as well. But yeah, that is the most common of all the approaches for formatting your code. So it's good that they have um, standardized and went, you know what, we'll just use the most common one known to man. So yeah, great. So if we can just run that, that's going to make life a lot easier because it's not always easy to run code formatters on notebooks. If you get the output of the notebook in the PY file and just running a code formatter, this is a bit, it's not great. So if we can just have the code formatted automatically as you're going through and working with it, that just makes life a lot easier. It's a nice little dev tool, makes it a better IDE for doing Python development. So good. Happy days. Uh, again, that 11.3 uh, LTS is now available. So we'll take a look at that and we'll have a look at the features in a second. Um, we can now do enforcing user isolation. So essentially the, the policies that we're getting. So when we, when Unity Catalog came in, we had these new different types of cluster uh, saying, well, actually, are, are we allowed to share user? Is it single access mode? All that kind of stuff. Um, so we can now actually prevent people from opening up certain types of cluster, uh, especially kind of... Um, there's certain types of clusters that means you're not going to use Unity Catalog and you can go and query files directly. If you do not want anybody to be able to go and query files directly and you want everything going through tables that have been registered with Unity Catalog, you can now do that. So you do that at a workspace level and say, right, we're going to turn off the ability to have no isolation, no isolation shared cluster access types or create legacy types or remove that kind of thing. So just general security around what kinds of cluster people can create. Okay, yeah, got another one. So Databricks Feature Store has had this idea of an online lookup. So if you didn't want it to be using the Delta tables that's created automatically by Feature Store, you wanted something that's a little bit snappier, a little bit faster for doing kind of real-time inference, uh, we had these options for using online stores. 
Now, online stores, previously, we could use uh, an Azure SQL Server. So we could use just SQL DB uh, knocking around Azure. We could use MySQL. Um, and there's different things that you could do there. Now, this, this is great news for me that we can now use Cosmos DB. Because Cosmos DB specifically, it's a, an Azure document store, is fantastic for doing uh, like lots and lots of um, concurrent inserts or writes of singleton records. So this kind of thing is saying, just look up the value from a record document stores are fantastic for. Um, so it makes a lot of sense. And actually, if we switch with the compatibility of this, so kind of in the online store section of feature store, uh, you've got a few things in there. And we see that this, this new ability to have it inside Os uh, Azure Cosmos DB allows us to do normal storing of data there, allows us to do a, a real-time lookup, which we could only do in uh, Azure MySQL previously. But we can now do a lookup in this serverless real-time inference. So I did a quick demo of Databricks Serverless SQL, uh, I think it was last week, talking about, you know, you see that Spark, which just quickly, really, really instantly comes up on seven, eight seconds. It's it's there as a functioning SQL server, Spark server, sorry. Um, this is doing the same, but for machine learning inference. So spinning up that single uh, node cluster and kind of being able to serve out and respond to a web service, saying this is going to work on that same serverless pattern. And if we want to be able to do an online lookup from there, that needs to go to Cosmos DB. So be aware if you're going down that alley, you need to be looking at Cosmos DB for doing any kind of uh, real-time feature store lookups. And we'll be talking about all those kind of stuff when I'm back from my holiday. So you'll have to hold on. Um, other bits. Another is, it made me laugh, but it is so, so requested. Um, we now have PartnerKit now has the ability to hook into Erwin Data Modeler. Now, Erwin is a fairly well-known uh, database relation, like entity relationship uh, modeler. So you can actually say, well, here's all my different tables, and that's got a primary key over to there, that's got foreign keys over there, and it allows you to map out this data of your uh, data warehouse. So that is now something you can do, and you can click into, um, into a, a Databricks workspace and reverse engineer the model. Uh, it looks just like so old, it makes me sad. <laughs> but it is so, so used in so many industries. So we can do this kind of thing and can connect to a workspace, reverse engineer and pull out. Here's all the different tables that have been registered in the SQL layer of uh, Databricks. So we're talking about, you know, Unity Catalog. Here's what's in our Unity Catalog and you start building those relationships and actually doing some kind of data documentation, some kind of entity mapping of what you've got in your lake house. Uh, so Erwin's very, very popular tool for doing that, especially in financial services and public sector and that kind of thing. So. There can be a lot of people who are very happy that we can now plug in uh, Erwin directly to it uh, and work, which is great. And finally, uh, you've now got, uh, so Fivetran we've seen lots and lots and lots of as kind of another one of those uh, ELT kind of data movement tools. Um, and now we've got not just from Partner Connect, which is kind of that third party marketplace of um, integrations, but you've now got this add data portal that we talked about in terms of saying, well, I want to just upload data. And you can now do that and saying, I want to add data from Fivetran and kind of just make that workflow a little bit easier. So it's kind of got easier ways to go and work with that and plug into that and do some stuff. And that's everything that we've got so far. So loads of different things coming in, a whole mix of third party elements, a whole mix of some features, just stuff going on. I think probably my favorite is the ability to use Pepe kind of formatting standards directly in a Python notebook because I'm a nerdy Python developer. That's fine. It makes me happy. Um, all right, so onto the runtime. So runtime LTS 11.3, uh, again, should be available now for a good 18 months. Uh, let's have a look what's new in here. Okay, so number one, there's a new, like, so there's a, an update to the Databricks Kinesis uh, connector. So Kinesis, Kinesis, I don't know. It's an Amazon um, streaming service, essentially. Uh, so if you're, you're connecting to AWS uh, sources, you're trying to use a Kinesis uh, endpoint, Essentially, you've now got this thing in EFO mode, which is the ex enhanced fan out mode. I mean, it's nothing to me as not an uh, AWS person, uh, but essentially kind of it's essentially allowing you to parallelize properly and have sort of you know, essentially the sharding of the, the stream allocated to different processes to make things a lot faster. So that makes a lot of sense. Uh, so yes, if you've been waiting for that, that is now in there. Uh, the other thing we saw in the last runtime is a load of these H3 geospatial functions added. There's some additional geospatial functions being added into it. And we've also got all of these expressions now available in Photon. So Photon, if you remember, is the, the updated version. It's the native execution version of Spark. 
where it runs things in C++. It runs via vectors, which means it has to have these functions baked into uh, essentially executable kernels. And if it doesn't have a certain function in there, that whole stage of the query drops back into normal Spark rather than in Photon Spark. Photon itself. Uh, so by the fact that those expressions are now all supported, it just means more of your queries. If you're doing geospatial stuff, you've got more chance of that being ran in Photon, therefore going much, much faster. So it's good. Generally, just maturity. It's making sure they're fully plugged in, making sure they're part and parcel of the performance operating model. So that's all good. Okay. Another one, so the increasing the initial partitions to scan for selective queries. Ooh. So if you were previously doing something like a, as it says, like a, a tail, a, a limit, a kind of a select limit, you, you're just saying, run this data frame query, bring me back some data, but only show me the first 10 records. Uh, then sometimes it'd be really, really selective and you'd say, well, I'm, if you only want 10 records, I'm just gonna go for the first partition or first couple of partitions. So it wasn't particularly representative of the data that you should have been dealing with. Uh, so now we can just, essentially we've got this, where we can go in we can change it so the kind of uh, the initial partitions is now set to n so if you don't tell it any other, anything else it'll just assume you want 10 of those partitions to be thing to scan before it filters it down to the data to give you but you can now change that in that selective initial num partitions if you're doing that a lot I'm not sure why you're doing that a lot but you can now play with it if you're doing it a lot so a new one that i'm really interested in that i've not had a chance to look at yet uh, is there's a new AQ, AQE planned versions visualization. So essentially, AQE is the adaptive query execution. So that's the thing that actually it starts a Spark job, and then after it's done, it's started reading the data, it looks at the data and goes, wait, did my original plan still work? No, that, that data is way different than I thought. Let's make a new plan, and then make a new plan, and then make a new plan. And so it's going to replan throughout the various stages of your Spark job. So I'm assuming we'll actually be able to see, well, it started with this plan and then it went to this plan and then it went to this plan. So we can see how AQ is actually so kicked in and taken part. Not had a chance to have a play or have a look with that yet, but that's a future video because that sounds pretty cool. So we can just demonstrate really easily. This is how much of a benefit AQ is had because we see the plan change and morph as it finds out more. So we should see that. Okay, other bits. Uh, in structured streaming mode, there's uh, a couple of new modes for asynchronous uh, prog progress tracking and asynchronous log purging. So we've seen asynchronous checkpointing coming in before, and that's where, it, as we stream, in between each micro-batch, it would update the, the checkpoint, do a micro-batch, update the checkpoint, and just like lots and lots of essentially kind of serial processes wrapped around each of our micro-batches. We switched that over to be um, synchronous, asynchronous. So actually, so it just it's doing that, but also we're already getting on with the next micro-batch while it's writing that stuff out. And this is a similar idea. So if it needs to go and remove a load of logs, if it needs to purge logs for kind of, uh, just to keep things going nice and fast, it's going to do that asynchronously rather than having that as things that sh essentially slow down between each uh, micro batch. That's good. Makes things faster. It's nice. Uh, another one. So if you're using streaming on top of Unity Catalog, so if you're streaming from a Unity Catalog table into a Unity Catalog table, there's a couple of limitations that you couldn't actually do. Uh, you can now use display. If you're streaming from a table that's been registered into unit catalog, you create a streaming data frame on top of it, and then you want to just display that data frame so you can see the results in real time. That now works. Didn't previously. So good. That's all good. Now this this is a it's a weird one. So pipeline events are now logged in JSON format. So if you're in uh, Azure Databricks and you're writing events to the driver log and you spin that driver log out somewhere, you'll now see these events in JSON format. But I don't know what this actually refers to. So let's talk about pipeline events. Are we talking about the live tables? Is this like uh, ML pipelines? Is this, this something else? I I don't know. It, it's, it's just a new form of format of logging. That's a thing. So I need to have a dig into that when I'm back and I'll have a look and try and see if we can figure out what that is. Usually when I do some kind of update like this, I'm like, I don't know what that is. Someone very helpful in the comments will go, hi, I know exactly what this is. Here's how it is. So if you know what kind of pipeline we're talking about that's going to be logged as JSON events from now on, is it DLT? Is it something else? I would love to know. Pop it down in the comments. <laughs> okay. Other bits. Uh, so arbitrary stateful processing in structured streaming with Python. So if you're doing some kind of unbounded state management and each event is going to be updating the state, whether it's looking at various different, you know, normally we're talking about kind of aggregates and maximum in this period, all those window function kind of things. Uh, so if you want to do kind of your completely arbitrary what that state is and you're writing it yourself as a bit of Python inside that Pandas uh, script, you can now do that as a function. 
Um, so you used to be able to do that only uh, if you're kind of uh, using Java API and it's kind of a very essentially secret hidden away bits of Spark. So you can now do that with that apply, uh, apply in pandas with state function. So there's going to be elements of that to watch out for. If you're dealing with huge amounts of data and you're doing massive stateful processing, be careful because that's to keep a load of data in memory. And that's going to put a load of strain on your overall work of using it for multiple different streams. But occasionally you have to do that kind of thing. So there you go. You can now do it in Python, which is all nice. Another one, got a change to how dates are read in CSVs. So if you've ever tried to just re-infer schema and kind of read in a load of data from some CSV files, you'll see it never actually recognizes the dates. So if you've got a load of dates in an Excel uh, thing and you try and kind of suck it in by CSV, it'll just go, well, that's a load of strings. Even if you look at it and you go, oh no, that's a date. Come on, it's a date. It looks like a date. Uh, and that's it was always just assumed that CSVs are dodgy. You'll get a mix of different date times. You get a mix of different formatting of the going, you know, kind of um, YYY, MMDD, or the other way around, or whatever it happens to be. So now they've actually improved it. So now if you're using 11.3 or more, it'll actually realize its dates. If, as long as the dates uh, format is the same for all records in that column, it'll go, right, they're all in the same, that's all the data. I'm going to assume that's a date. Uh, even if different columns have different formatting. So that one is in American style, that one is kind of, uh, you know, English style, whatever it happens to be. That's fine. As long as all the records for a given column use the same date format, it'll now actually infer it properly and bring it in, which is nice. Um, cloning. So we can now clone Parquet and Iceberg tables. So in Delta, you can clone a table. So if you've got a Delta table, you can clone it to another table, and that creates kind of just a, a temporary transaction log that points to the original data files in the thing that you're cloning. Um, and that allows you to kind of write update statements, allows you to kind of write kind of uh, anything that you want into there to see what would happen if you did that on the main table. That's what we call a shallow clone. Or you can do a deep clone, which is just a full copy of the data. Uh, and now we can do the same thing um, across a parquet table or a uh, iceberg table. So really, really interesting. So if someone's got something as Apache iceberg and they want to keep it as Apache iceberg, you can create a delta clone of it and then be working with it. Uh, and I've not had a look at this kind of incremental change as well. So even after you've done the clone, if you want to keep passing changes over, rather than have to trash and rebuild the clone, uh, you can incrementally build things over. Not had a look into how that works and how it fits together, but yeah, super, super interesting. Okay, then finally, there are some behavior changes and they're kind of more minor things about bugs that used to happen that no longer happens. Have a look through that. And as always, there's a giant pile of library changes and bugs that were fixes and all the kind of Jira tickets that went into that Spark release. Whoa. So, lots of things went into the month of October. Loads and loads of things in there. Um, again, got a load of UI changes, got the lovely bit of Python formatting, got a new runtime to have a play with. Changes to how streaming works, changes to how thing, age old things like DSV date inference works. Yeah, lots of stuff going on. As always, I do recommend you have a look through the release notes yourselves. You have a look through uh, the libraries and make sure if you're using any particular set of libraries in any of the things you're doing. Take a look at that before you switch your runtime over. Make sure it's still compatible. And yeah, I'll catch you next time. Cheers.